Our different sessions, we're going to be talking all about creativity as part of these sessions, which of course is so important. You know, when we talk about all of the different things happening in schools, there are so many fantastic things happening in schools, but if we're not careful, creativity actually becomes something that, if we're not careful, gets a little bit squeezed out. So today is something, this afternoon session is all about creativity. It's all about, it's all about making the most of opportunities for creativity. So we've got two sessions for you, um, and as part of those sessions, we're going to be exploring different things. So we're joined by some guests. We're joined by Emma Bairstow for the first session. Emma is an artist who, is work who works with schools uh, in all kinds of different ways, um, developing all sorts of creative artwork with them, and she's going to share some of her work with you, which will be really exciting, really interesting. Then after that, um, we've got a session, a second session, um, led by myself and uh, Sam Smith um, from, from Flanshaw Junior and Infant School in Wakefield. And we're going to be talking all about uh, block play and storytelling, small world play. We're going to be talking about all that creative storytelling. All right, so lots to explore with you, lots to talk about. Just before we get started, um, we are not expecting a fire, you'll be pleased to know. Um, and so if the fire alarm does go off, it is a kind of a, the real thing, the real deal. Um, so we just need to exit the building. So the exits, in terms of the exits from this particular room, um, if you go out of here and turn left into the interactive environment, there's an exit at the end there on the left. If you go right and then turn right just before you get to the cafe, there's an exit there that you can go straight out to the front of the building. And if, you, if the alarm goes off and you're at that end of the building, you can just go out where you came in, in a way you, where you kind of signed in first thing. Okay. Um, that's about it in terms of the kind of the, I suppose, the housekeeping bit. So I will hand over to Emma. The other thing just to say in terms of these sessions is that we're, of course, joined by you people. And we're really grateful, actually, the number of people that come out for these events. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. I know it's not always easy. You get to the end of a, a school day and it's not... You know, it's not necessarily the first thing you want to do is to get into the car and drive across the M62 and come along to an event like this. I appreciate that completely. So it's fantastic that you really have. Um, but we're also joined by lots of people who are at home on our joining us on Facebook. So they're at school or on, at their home. Um, and so they're you know, out there in the world, online, or all over the place um, joining us. So if you are joining our event, and you are there on Facebook. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you could, because your colleagues, of course, will be watching and will be um, wanting to watch and be hopefully interested in all of the things that we've got to say as part of this session, then do give us a share, give us a like, because you can then share it with your colleagues as well. Okay. All right. For those of you people who are here face-to-face, -face, live in the moment, seeing it as it happens, um, if you want to go back to it and watch the recording after the event, you can do so. We will put it on our website so that you can watch it in future and share it with your colleagues. Okay. Right. That's about it in terms of my part for now. I will hand over to Emma. Emma is going to be talking to you all about creativity and artwork and the wonderful world of all of the work that she does. Okay. Right. Over to you, Emma. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's so lovely to be here today. It's been a while since I've been at the centre um, doing anything like this. And, yeah, put, uh, before COVID, I think, was the last time. And, um, yeah, it's a real pleasure. So... Thanks for having me. Um, so I am going to talk to you today a little bit about some of the stuff that I do. Um, my sister, we have our own company doing schools and also about mark making, which I know you will all be really familiar with. Um, and I was a bit worried about doing mark making with Lord of Early Years teachers because I was thinking, oh, they all know what they're doing. But it's just really nice sometimes to focus in. I think me and Sam were discussing at the start just to have a little focus on one thing because you're all doing so many different things all the time in class. So just a little bit about my background. So I started off as, um, like I used to work down in London, I've got an art degree um, and started off as a teaching assistant supporting with uh, PPA cover teaching art in schools. Um, sort of 10 years later, a little bit more, I've been building 
contacts and working alongside amazing head teachers all over the country and amazing teachers um, and children building um, just sort of embracing creativity in primary schools thinking about um, displays, uh, art lessons, team teaching with teachers, group work with children, um, lots of uh, staff training and CPD. It's just a few examples here. Um, the company is called Artworks Education and it's uh, myself and my sister who we both got an art background um, and we both kind of bring different things to the to the business, Amy has a lot, a bit more time. I've got two children under four, um, and she's so she does a lot more of her own artwork at the moment. But we we go into schools and we basically sh we we share our expertise with the teachers and sort of encourage and build confidence in teaching themselves. Um, we also focus a lot on just raising the expectations of what art is in primary school um, and in the early years. Art is everywhere in the early years. Creativity is everywhere. Um, I think it's just working out sort of where things need to change or where things, just how to focus on certain areas a little bit more, resourcing um, and just, it's kind of bringing a focus in. So it, it's great to have that exploration, that's what we want, but then it's finding a way of, finding a balance between um, the exploration and then also building on some of those skills in a more detailed way. So that's a lot of what we do too. Um, we look at how our role as art, coming from art backgrounds, how that can be made really accessible for, for teachers. Um, so thinking about you don't have to be an artist to create fantastic art opportunities. It might just be finding ways of creating fantastic resources and building your own confidence so that you can do some great modelling on the carpet, something like that. So just thinking about how we embrace creativity in our schools. So like I've said, it's about striking a balance between encouragement and guidance and then letting go of the creative control. That's something as an artist myself I find, I've found tricky in my career in this job, is finding a way of stepping back and not sort of helicoptering in and doing it for them. So, and that is a constant pull. As, as adults, we, we strive for outcomes, I think. And I think early years practitioners and maybe I work across the whole across the whole of primary school, and I feel like it kind of changes as you get further up school even more. But I think finding a way of stepping back and letting the children do, as well as seeing where they need a little bit of support and guidance, and but it's kind of finding that balance all the time. Um, confident teaching, so sitting on the carpet and modelling skills with them. This is when I work in reception and nursery, I will always have a carpet session where I sit and I'm look, we're look, we're looking at holding a tiny brush and how to hold it and doing delicate lines. Whether they take that and do that is a different thing. And it's about letting go there and letting them explore and giving them also lots of other opportunities to explore that same feeling with different kinds of materials. Guided group work is a great way to focus on particular skills, as long as there's other areas in the classroom where that freedom is and where the children can go off and play and find that creativity in other areas. But having a guided group where you can actually sit and work on a particular skill. So this project here, this was a little girl in reception at Jerry Clay. So they were doing a project on mini beasts. So they were looking at and painting butterflies and we looked at butterfly wings and I did a model on the carpet where I was looking at how to, to use line and, um, and fill up a page with lots of different lines. So they kind of had to stretch, we had like lots of pictures of butterflies, like close up of wings and they had to stretch that across and they were looking at lines and circles basically. And then we were using little brushes and adding in the watercolour. So they were practicing mixing light, light and dark by adding less and more water. And they could, you're sat with them, not doing it for them, I'm sat with them and I'm guiding them. That's going on, but there's also pastels, there's also pens, paint, other areas that are all set up with the, the same sort of theme um, that it's sort of hung on. So they've got both things, and I sort of pull children, do bits at a time, and they can come and go as they please. So the way that I work in schools with teachers is looking at 
planning often <laughs> lots of different ways workshops all sorts of things but planning is something that, that I find has a really really big impact in schools so I will go in and my sister will go in and we will work with teachers in early years and throughout primary school thinking about a sort of a, a six point plan like a half terms worth of of art lessons and how to get from A to B. In early years it's a bit different from that, you can't plan like that because things just go where they go and that's really, really important that it does that and the children find their outcomes naturally. But having, what one thing that I give to early years teachers or we work together to find is like an overriding theme for each half term. So if you're doing fairy tales like this school was, we actually just took the forest as a, a lot of their settings for their fairy tales was ba were based in the forest. Rather than trying to do specific fairy tale projects, we just took the forest as a theme for six weeks. And they explored it in so many different ways. So they looked at these, this series of lessons I did with them. This was at Delta, um, at Southmere Primary part of, in Bradford, part of the Delta Academy Trust. So we looked at observational drawing as a starting point, looking at stretching your hand right up from the bottom of the page to the top. And then they looked at mark making, so making brown using different materials and the different colours and different materials to drag the colours together. And then they took those drawing tree skills and just started dragging them. And that happened without me telling them to do that. They were just doing it and it was, oh, we've made a tree. And it was stretching it up. And the teachers then took it in a sort of just carried it on. And they then, over the next few weeks, looked at rubbings, they did all sorts of different kinds of painting techniques and all sorts. And it was just amazing to see how the project developed. So with, when I'm working with early years in school, we'll look at a theme, we'll look at what kind of skills are they exploring through that theme, what do we want them to be focusing on? How can we encourage that in the best way? We'll look at um, what are they practicing and repeating and developing and building on? And then what outcomes may come from this? So you can't sort of preempting halfway through where it, where it's going. Um, and then how can we showcase the learning journey? So we want to create a record. We want to celebrate everything the children are doing from the mark making to any outcomes that might come from that. So thinking about mark making, um, there's so it's ap well absolutely fundamental. It's a human instinct to make marks. It's absolutely primal. Um, children can make marks before they can speak. Um, it's the first one of the first ways of communicating. It's not only supporting communication, but it's building the muscles to write, um, and then also as adults reminding us how to play and be free. What I mean by that is when, when I, I don't know if any of you have done a GCSE or A-level art at school, and it's very particular. You are trained or you are taught to paint in a specific way, which is often trying to create a photograph-like image of something. It's really tricky to do well in GCSE or A-level art if you are not good at painting in a photographic way, but that isn't what art is. So when I did my A-levels um, and I went to my, I was lucky enough to do a foundation at Bradford College, the first thing that they made us do was do a whole week of drawing and painting using potatoes and, <laughs> and all sorts of other things that we could find. And we were allowed to touch a pencil or a paintbrush for a week and we had to do all these different projects but we had to use anything but. And it was amazing, it was so freeing coming from uh, a school that where you'd been kind of told you were good or you were bad, depending on how you drew or painted. Um, it was really free. And so I think there's something really powerful about bringing mark making throughout school. And it starts in the early years and it's celebrating that in such a, such a big way because it is amazing and they learn so much from it. You can do mark making through sculpture, through painting and colour mixing printing and pattern making, sort of blend, looking at how to blend and fine motor, stretching and using your arms, printing. So this here was a little bit of polystyrene and the children had to bit dig into it and make marks into it and then print with it. You explore all the different sort of 
art forms, mediums and the terminology that actually is in the national curriculum from Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2, all of that stuff you can actually find just through mark making. So it's an amazing starting point and it's absolutely essential. So when you actually read the national curriculum for Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 and all of the art words and the terminology that come, it's very, very simple and vague actually, <laughs> but it, all the, the terminology that they use, you can, actually do, you can actually do a lot of that through mark making, which I find very freeing. Um, so thinking about that from, as, a, as, a base, as a baseline, and then how you take those skills and you take it then to the next step, which is then implementing that into actually observational drawing. So like the control and the fine motor that you're using through mark making, that is then reinforcing how to, what a shape is, how to transfer a shape that you're printing into a shape that you're drawing. These children here, this is a school called Abbey Park in Bradford, and we, they were doing a project on um, mills and looms and things, and they, they were drawing these old kind of bobbins and they did lots of printing to begin with and then they looked at drawing them and drawing the shapes. I just thought they were absolutely fantastic. And we, we've got to sort of remember that we're setting them up for, key, for year one. So we're, we're, although the free play and the exploration is absolutely essential, the mark making, exploring, we, but they're going to be in year one and they, they we're going to have to some skills need to come to. So it's, it's, it's finding that balance between the both things. So this is year one at Jerry Clay. Um, and the, I, you can kind of see when you work with the early years and the foundation students that they're kind of on, they're on a journey. And then um, this is Academy St. James in Bradford where I work once a week. And they're sort of, I've observed these children, um, obviously it's quite early on in the year, but they really understand what to look for with a shape and put that onto paper. So just coming back, this is the same school, this is Academy St James. So this is a project that I just wanted to share with you. We were doing leaves in autumn and we looked at Klimt as an artist, so like look, using a lot of his patterns and colours and the autumny colours. So they started off with mark making drawings, just circles, and they were looking at some of the close-ups of Klimt's work, which was like circles and squares and rectangles and lots of lines and things. And they, they had to draw these leaves as big as they could on the paper and then just fill them with those lines. And then from that, we led on to creating some sort of leaf sculptures. Um, and then we displayed it all together. This was a big class one that I supported them with. Um, but they had their individual ones here and these were the different bits. This is a, supposed to be like a learning wall, so that's my modelling there. And then they kind of, we kind of put their work across. This is um, the same school. So this is, you can, you can see examples here of the mark making and how that's fed into looking at, we do include an artist as well. So not always, but I think having artists brought into their, um, their projects is really, really good to get them thinking about art outside the classroom and other people that do it. So they're using that, making lines, dragging shapes, and then they're putting them into some drawings, and then they had to make these landscapes themselves. And it was kind of like a, a process of working with small groups of children and, and doing mark making, and then coming back the following week, and we were sort of building on it and building on it week by week. Okay, so this is just an example of some other kinds of mark making. Some of this stuff you've probably done, you might have seen, but I absolutely loved sort of seeing this happening. I didn't do this with them, the teacher did this with them. They used a, a spinning clay wheel, they put paint on it and they spun it and it created these amazing patterns. And then this CD one's nice as well. So thinking about, uh, this was a project called Move It and this was exploring fine motor. And um, they, they basically just sort of created these Kandinsky style circles. So, Today is designed to be a bit of a taster session. Um, I'm going to be delivering a full day's session which is going to be way more practical in March, which if anyone, hopefully you will, you'll all hear about that at some point when it starts, when we advertise it. But um, at the moment, what I wanted to just share with you is some of the things that we'll be focusing on in more detail on that day. And if we had more time today or we had a bit more room, we might do some of this today. But thinking about 
looking at line, exploring drawing in a different way, so experimental drawing, thinking about creating tools to draw with that are longer, uh, you know, drawing at different angles, lying on the floor and drawing under, like putting things underneath the table, things you've probably all done before. Um, so we'll be looking at line, we'll be looking at pattern, we'll be looking at, sorry, it's just a bit, making our own selection of different kinds of mark making tools, things that you might not have done before, and exploring colour and drawing through that. So taking, we're, we're kind of going to be focusing on the bit between the mark making and the drawing and how to get from that point to that point, if that makes sense. And we'll look at colour as well through that. Um, if anyone wants sort of to follow me on Twitter, if anyone's inspired by anything that you've seen um, or wants to give me an email for any ideas or anything at any point, I'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you. That's all for today. Very good. Big round of applause then. Um, I followed Emma actually on Twitter just recently and it, well, it is well worth, if you are on Twitter and uh, you are looking for somebody to follow in terms of lots of ideas, in terms of creativity and the work that she's done in schools, I would certainly recommend it. There are, there are loads of things on there, on, on, um, on social media that Emma has shared that are absolutely fantastic. Okay, right, so um, as Emma said, she's going to come back and do a session for, her, for us later on in the year, so do watch out for details around that. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a short break, okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to come back and have uh, a session that is led by myself and by Sam Smith, all about creative block play and around, around creative storytelling. Okay, so if we could come back into this room in uh, 15 minutes time, if that's all right. So go and have a bit of an explore of the center. Go and have a bit of a wander around. Lots of different things for you to see. Go and have a bit of an explore. If we come back here at five to, uh, well, I'm gonna, I was gonna say five to six, five to five, please, if that's all right. Come back here in 15 minutes time and we'll go from there, all right. Welcome to the interactive environment here at the Early Excellence Centre. You're going to be able to go on a tour around the whole of this space. You'll be able to see continuous provision areas all organised and set out for you to explore. And you'll also be able to see enhanced provision areas too. So different spaces around, around the classroom, different enhancements. As you do go on about your tour, have a think about the whole of the space first of all. The structure and the way that it's organised and how those zones have been created. Then look in detail at each different space in turn. Look at the level of organisation and the resourcing, the way that materials have been carefully selected for each of the different spaces. The best way to get the most out of the tour is to do the tour in conjunction with using this document here, our continuous provision guide. There are lots of things here for you to, to support you in terms of your development of your practice and your development of your environment, 
but also planning guides as well at the back so that you can see the thinking behind all of the different materials and resources that belong in each of the different spaces. Don't forget to go outside as well, so to explore the different, um, the different outdoor stores that we've got. We've got an outdoor store, a large outdoor store, so you can access it through the door at the, the end of the classroom here. A large outdoor store and our smaller outdoor stores as well, fully equipped to provide that inspiring and effective outdoor curriculum. And finally, if through going on your tour, if, as we hope it does, it really inspires you, it gets you thinking, then if, you want to, if we can support you in developing your own indoor or outdoor environments, then do get in touch. And if you're interested in our training, both indoor and outdoor training, or consultancy visits, then it would be great to hear from you. is a child psychologist and neuroscientist specialising in concentration and stress in young children. You might recognise Sam as one of the on-screen child psychologists in the popular Channel 4 programmes The Secret Lives of Four-Year-Olds and The Secret Lives of Five-Year-Olds. Now as part of my chat with Sam we discuss all sorts of things really. We talk about what is concentration. We also talk about stress alongside concentration. And an interesting one, I think, also for you EYFS teachers and practitioners, we talk about controlling environments to improve concentration and also how children respond to repetition. OK, so we cover all sorts of things that I think you'll find really interesting. All right, so here you go. Here I am in conversation with Professor Sam Wass. <laughs> So I'm uh, Professor Samos and I'm an expert in um, uh, early years development. So we start really with babies going through to, you know, reception year one. Um, and the main focus of my research is looking at stress and concentration and the relationship between the two and how they develop through the first few years of life. Uh, and we look a lot at uh, typically developing babies uh, and children, uh, but we also look at the early stages of uh, clinical conditions such as autism spectrum disorders, uh, attention deficit disorder, um, anxiety and affective disorders and so on. It sounds absolutely fascinating, Sam, your work, I have to say. And in, in the lead up to the to interviewing you today, I've been I've been like a stalker. I've been watching all of your YouTube clips. I've literally watched your whole back catalogue, Sam. So um, I feel like I know I know such a lot about your, your work just from the kind of the potted history of what I've watched. So I'm, you know, I'm...
of our great specialisms at Early Excellence is equipping the learning environment to most effectively support young children's development. And it's here in our head office that this journey begins. This is where we uh, design all of the furniture that we supply and we source really high quality resources and books to ensure that you have access to things that will help your children to learn. Our commitment to the learning environment is born out of not only our understanding of how your children learn but from really high expectations about how you can manage the environment to provide really rich learning opportunities. All of our curriculum consultants are experienced early years and key stage one leaders and they can work really closely with you to, to help you to design your space. They will help you to prioritise your budget and ensure that you invest in long term change in environments that are thoughtfully equipped with resources and books to inspire learning. The most important part of what we do is that we plan with you. We talk with you about your vision for learning and we help you to establish a multifaceted environment that is right for the needs of your children. We offer you a complete service from beginning to end, so whenever you need to develop your environments, we can help you every step of the way.
Welcome to the interactive environment here at the Early Excellence Centre. You're going to be able to go on a tour around the whole of this space. You'll be able to see continuous provision areas all organised and set out for you to explore. And you'll also be able to see enhanced provision areas too. So different spaces around, around the classroom, different enhancements. As you do go on about your tour, have a think about the whole of the space first of all. The structure and the way that it's organised and how those zones have been created. Then look in detail at each different space in turn. Look at the level of organisation and the resourcing, the way that materials have been carefully selected for each of the different spaces. The best way to get the most out of the tour is to do the tour in conjunction with using this document here, our continuous provision guide. There are lots of things here for you to, to support you in terms of your development of your practice and your development of your environment but also planning guides as well at the back so that you can see the thinking behind all of the different materials and resources that belong in each of the different spaces. Don't forget to go outside as well, so to explore the different, um, the different outdoor stores that we've got. We've got an outdoor store, a large outdoor store, so you can access it through the door at the, the end of the classroom here. A large outdoor store and our smaller outdoor stores as well, fully equipped to provide that inspiring and effective outdoor curriculum. And finally, if through going on your tour, if, as we hope it does, it really inspires you, it gets you thinking, then if, you want to, if we can support you in developing your own indoor or outdoor environments, then do get in touch. And if you're interested in our training, both indoor and outdoor training or consultancy visits, then it would be great to hear from you. is a child psychologist and neuroscientist specialising in concentration and stress in young children. You might recognise Sam as one of the on-screen child psychologists in the popular Channel 4 programmes The Secret Lives of Four-Year-Olds and The Secret Lives of Five-Year-Olds. Now as part of my chat with Sam we discuss all sorts of things really. We talk about what is concentration. We also talk about stress alongside concentration. And an interesting one, I think, also for you EYFS teachers and practitioners, we talk about controlling environments to improve concentration and also how children respond to repetition. OK, so we cover all sorts of things that I think you'll find really interesting. All right, so here you go. Here I am in conversation with Professor Sam Wass. <laughs> Of our uh, of our of our sessions this uh, uh, I was going to say this evening this evening kind of uh, this afternoon this evening um, all about we're talking of course all about creativity we've got off to a flying start with Emma talking of course all about fantastic artwork about mark making about all the different sorts of things that you, of course you can do with your children at school um, if you want to know more about Emma's work then do come along to the sessions that she's going to be running here at Early Excellence later on in the year uh, but also if you get in touch with Emma Emma's details were just at the end of the presentation there if you want to get in touch with Emma um, she, I'm she hasn't got much much um, availability in terms of her diary, but if you do get in touch, she'll be able to fit you in, I would think. Okay, all right, so good, a brilliant start, fantastic start. We're going to carry on now talking about creativity, but this time creativity in a slightly different way. We're going to be talking about creativity in terms of storytelling. So storytelling, of course, incredibly important. 
Um, I often find when I work with schools that we often rush into getting children to write stories. And of course, writing stories is, is a fantastic thing, and it's something that we're aiming to do, it's something that we're really, uh, of course, that's the end goal, if you like, in terms of what we're aiming for for those children. But when we think about young children, young children will naturally want to tell stories. They are, they are absolutely um, brimming with stories. They are so full of stories. They'll want to tell stories. They love telling stories, and they love you telling them stories. And I do think sometimes there is, a, there is a real risk that actually we put such a lot of emphasis on the writing that we get in, we get in the way of that real power of storytelling when children are so naturally keen on telling stories and, and enjoy telling stories. And that process of telling stories, if we do it well and if we engage in it creatively, which of course is what we're talking about today, if we do it in, in, in a a way which is sensitive and nurturing, we can do it in a way that does lead into that writing process, but that actually doesn't start off with the writing process. I think we're very quick to pick pencils up and very quick to get children having a go at writing, when actually a child with a pencil in their hand looking at a blank sheet of A4 paper isn't doing anybody any favours really, the child or, or ourselves in terms of that writing process. So actually, if we're looking at that motivation to write, if we're looking at what actually underpins that writing process or that process of literacy and literacy skills, then storytelling is the perfect place to start. So, let's have a think about that. Well, let's start off with this, the power of stories. As human beings, we have always been engaged in storytelling. Okay? It's something that we've been drawn to do. So Marion Whitehead said this, she said, wherever there are people, there are stories. Stories were drawn, drawn on cave walls by prehistoric human groups, and stories have continued to be sculpted, danced, acted, sung, and recited. But most commonly, stories are told. So commonly, in fact, that we take them for granted and do not appreciate their significance. Stories are an incredibly powerful part of what it is to be a human being, I think. Um, it, stories actually, I think, help us, to, they help us to communicate, of course, but they also do much more than that. I think they help us to feel that we belong. Now, if you think about, um, if you think about when you get together for a celebration, okay? So, say, say, say Christmas. When you get together for Christmas, all right? And you're there, hopefully, with your family group around you, okay? What happens as soon as we've got those familiar people around us? We start to tell stories. You know, do you remember when Grandad did this? And do you remember when that happened? Do you remember this story? And why do we do that? Well, we do that because it, it, brings, it, gives us, it brings us closer together. It, it, it helps us to feel like a, a family, a family group, a community. And shared, shared experiences like that are important. Importantly, they are also crucial in terms of feeling that we belong within a class group as well. So not just a family group, but within a, a group within the classroom. So when we're talking about your ch our children within our classroom, a great way to help them feel that they belong to this group, that they, they have an identity, a positive identity within the group, is to involve them in stories and storytelling. That might be retelling and telling the stories that have happened to us while we've been in this group of children. Yeah, so when this group of children have been together, what's, been, what's happened that was funny? Let's tell that story again of what happened. Um, let's tell the story of what happened at the, that day that the water tray leaked or whatever, you know, whatever else happens. Those sorts of funny stories, those interesting stories, those, those stories that bring us closer together are important to tell. But of course, that takes time. It does take time out of our day. And it's not always easy to timetable that storytelling. And so sometimes it can get squeezed out of our day because things that are not timetabled do get squeezed out. So we have to be quite careful with that. And yet storytelling is so important. It's part of what makes us human beings, really. 
Marion Whitehead went on to say this, she said, the child's growing understanding of the links between oral language and emerging literacy will not be fostered by ever earlier formal reading and writing lessons, but by participating in the creation and exchange of stories and playfully exploring the nature of language. I really like that phrase at the end, playfully exploring the nature of language. It's important to consider that when we talk about literacy skills, literacy skills do not just happen at one particular point in the day. So they don't just happen for in that 45 minutes or an hour or whatever time you have when you do your, your, your particular literacy scheme. It doesn't just happen then, of course. Storytelling and literacy skills will be happening right away, right across your day, and we need to make sure that we value all of those opportunities for those skills as they emerge. I love this quote. James Britton said this. He said, reading and writing float on a sea of joy. <coughs> it's a fantastic quote. And one which, whilst it's not a new quote, as you can see here, is incredibly important and if not if not relevant then 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 more and more relevant i think okay it's not irrelevant to what we're talking about now it's probably more becoming more and more relevant and as time goes on when you think about post pandemic when you think about um, following on from the covid pandemic and the children coming into our schools not necessarily having the same speaking and listening skills as previously and in previous years. We have to consider this link between reading and writing and talk. And there are certainly, I think, times when we are trying to get children who struggle with talk to be able to do the reading and the writing, when actually it floats on a sea of talk, as James Britton said, <coughs> that actually we've got to get the talk first of all. So storytelling and talk, incredibly important. Hang on, might have to use the yeah, two arrows instead. There we are. If you would like further reading on this, um, I would certainly recommend this book. Um, I interviewed... Um, uh, at Trisha Lee for the podcast, the Early Excellence podcast, just recently. And Trisha was absolutely fantastic. The episode hasn't gone out yet. It's going out in a couple of weeks' time. Um, she was talking about this book. She's absolutely fantastic. She was one of those people that you could just listen to for hours. She absolutely br brought the whole idea of storytelling to life. She was absolutely brilliant. Um, this book is, is her second book, um, Helicopter Stories in Action, The Growth of the Storyteller. And she talks about her work within schools, where what she does is, yes, she gets children writing, of course, but actually that's not all that she does. She starts off by really building up those children as storytellers, okay, and listening to them and giving them the opportunity to tell a story, whatever that, might, that story might be. It might be one little line, an idea, a germ of an idea. And then she helps them grow that germ of, of an idea. And she, she scribes for them. So she writes their ideas down and really values their ideas. And she helps them turn their stories into longer stories that flow and cre have really creative ideas. And to tell those stories and celebrate those stories. And yes, actually, it eventually leads to children who are confident storytellers and story writers, and of course there's more work that goes into it than that, I'm simplifying it, but actually it's, fan it's a fantastic approach. So if you're interested, the book is here at the centre, if you want to go and have a look, it, we've got it in the cafe, and I think it might well be in the resource centre as well, but certainly well worth a look, I would highly recommend it. Click has started to work now, bizarrely. Um, so, the power of story is so important, okay, which leads us to a big question. How often do you tell stories in your setting, okay? How often do you tell stories? Now, I need to clarify this a little bit, okay? Because I'm not just talking about getting a book off the shelf and then reading a story. That, of course, is telling a story, but that's not just it, okay? If we want children to have their own ideas for stories, 
and to tell stories and get used to telling stories, they need to listen to us telling stories also. And that's not just getting a book off a shelf and reading it, that's telling a story. So it's well worth thinking through, you know, how often do you, do you get the children together and then you say, let me tell you about what happened this morning when I left the house. You won't believe what happened yesterday. Or you won't believe when I, when I got home yesterday after school, you won't believe what happened. How often do you tell that sort of story? Because I think if we give the impression that stories are just in published books on the bookshelf in the book area, then that's so far removed from what the, ch the child can do or produce, that actually we're giving the impression, I think, sometimes that actually that's, you know, it's about being a published author. They tell a story. When I think part of our job really is to show children that I can tell a story, you can tell a story. So, how often do you tell stories in your classroom? How often do you tell stories about what's happened to you, about what happened to you on the way to school, about your pets at home, or whatever it might be? How often do you do that, and is that value as part of your practice? Have a couple of minutes, talk to the people next to you. What do you think about this? I can stop you there, please, if that's all right. Um, we better move on.
Now, in terms of ideas around storytelling, I mean, the first thing is making sure, of course, that you do give time for that to happen and you do value storytelling so that you engage in storytelling with your children, okay? And what you'll find is that actually, if you tell a story about your cat at home and what your cat's done or whatever, you know, whatever happened in terms of, you know, when you, when you left from home this morning, you stepped in a puddle or whatever happened, that actually your children will really like the way you told their particular story and they'll, they'll say, can you tell us that one again? And you know, you'll end up coming back to it and coming back to it. And that is important. Telling and retelling stories is important. Um, partly because as we tell it, we become more familiar with it, but also we get better at telling stories the more we tell that story. So we know when, when to leave a pause, when to build a bit of suspense, how to, how to really, really draw out a particular moment. We tell it and retell it, it, we get better at it. And it's of course the same for children. If we model that, then actually telling and retelling stories is important. That is the same for children. And children will learn to tell a story and be able to retell it and think about, actually, could I do that slightly differently? Okay. Um, quite a, a good way of doing this and getting into the habit of, of doing this is to have a, have a basket or a box or something like that at the front of your room. Could be just a simple shoe box or something like that. So just somewhere near to where your carpet area is. And each time you have a story that you tell, or each time you have an experience together, gather one object that represents that experience or that story and put it in your story basket or your story box or whatever you want to call it. Okay? So it might be that you go on a, a it might be that you go on a school visit, or you go to a local park, or you, you go to a farm, or whatever it might be, have one thing that represents what it is that you did. Put it in the box and let's retell the story of what happened when we went on that visit. Do you remember what happened on the coach that day or whatever it might be? Yeah? Retell that story and this will help us to remember that story, this object. So putting together a simple story basket of things that represent a story, I think it's quite an interesting idea. Okay, right, so we've, we've already established that stories are important that stories are a, a fantastic, natural way into those opportunities for reading and writing, that, that of course, reading and writing float on a sea of talk, as we talked about earlier on. So where do we need to look in terms of our practice? Well, of course, storytelling can happen in all kinds of different areas of provision, but we're gonna focus in on one particular area as part of this session. Um, now you'll know, of course, if you've been on early excellence training before, you will know that we talk about, in terms of effective practice, in terms of really making sure we have effective practice, we talk about the three key areas of effective practice. That early years practice can be very easily muddled, I think. You know, it can be, it can be a bit like being bombarded by so much information sometimes that you kind of think, crikey, where do I start with all of this? Our advice would always be think about the three key areas of practice and focus in on that and get that right. Okay, and those three key bits are the child, so understanding child development, understanding how young children learn, understanding what drives young children's learning. That would be our first part, so understanding the child or the children in our setting. Secondly, the environment. And thirdly, the adults and how they engage with the children and how they engage within that environment. Okay, so three key elements of practice. In terms of within this session, we're going to focus in on the environment. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the blocks and the small world area. Okay, so we would always recommend that in terms of using materials and resources effectively, having block play alongside small world play makes sense, okay? So block play being wooden blocks of different, as you can see here, different shapes and sizes, and small world play, of course, being all of those figures and characters, people, creatures, animals. Now, the reason that, I, that it's important, we would say, to put the two together 
is that by having the two together, as you can see here, children will create story settings, towers, enclosures, they'll place their characters into it, they'll do all of, all of those sorts of things. You're talking about that kind of story mapping play or creating a story setting. That's what we're aiming for here. Quite often when I work within schools, quite often people will have wooden blocks but they'll put it within their small construction area and then small world will be somewhere else. We would say actually it's far better to have the wooden blocks and the small world together and the construction somewhere different. Okay. So we're going to have a look at that. So why small world first of all? Why is it important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. It gives the children the opportunity to have their own ideas, to carry those ideas out, to create a story in different ways. It gives them the opportunity to pretend and play out different roles within those small world figures. And what about the blocks then? Why would we have the blocks with those, with those story characters? Well, it gives the opportunity to, to design a setting for stories or story characters. It gives them the opportunity to express their own thoughts and their own ideas. It gives them the opportunity to create real and imagined buildings and story settings, structures and imaginative worlds. It means they can try things and adapt things. They can work, work out what's not quite working here so they can problem solve. So lots of mathematical opportunities there. There are, it naturally leads into quite a lot of labelling, quite a lot of creating maps or story mapping. You know, a big roll of paper within a box area is fantastic. It provides the children with that opportunity to create that story map. Let's draw it and build on top of it. Yeah, that is something that's fantastic as an opportunity. And of course leads to opportunities to use a wide variety of vocabulary and scientific and geographical language as well. So the first thing then to consider is where does the small world and block area need to be? Okay, so if we're going to have small world and block play together, where does it go? Well, quite interesting to consider here, what I would always recommend Really having small world and block play together, but also having it away from where it's going to be disturbed. You don't, I would say, you don't really want it in the middle of the room here. Because as soon as you've got a, ch a child or children building a tower, you're going to have two or three children walking through and just, oh, sorry, I've knocked your tower over. You know, that kind of thing's going to happen. Whereas if you have it within an enclosed space over here, in a space ideally down here, where children are not just walking through, but that actually children can create a structure and then maybe leave it up and come back to it, that's going to be more effective. Okay, so the structure of the room does make a difference to the quality of what you'll get there. So block play and small world play together so that we've got the blocks to create the structures, the small world play, to then add that detail in terms of storying, in terms of creating ideas for those characters. In terms of the space itself, you don't need to overload it. You don't need lots and lots of small world figures. Okay, so you don't need loads and loads. It's far better to offer quality than quantity. Yeah, you don't need, so when we're talking about farm animals, for example, a hundred cows you do not need, yeah? Um, and do think about actually having actually a small number of, of items that actually are of, of real quality rather than lots and lots of things. Um, I often find that when working with schools and working with settings, we try to give the children just too much because we want them to do lots of things with the resources, but then we give them lots of resources to be able to do that with. But actually, in reality, having fewer resources, children will be able to do more. They can, work, they can use those materials and tend to value them more if we have slightly fewer. Okay. So, in an enclosed space, away from that traffic around the room, that's the sort of thing that we're looking at. In terms of materials and resources, there are, of course, a wide range of different sorts of blocks. And really, really interesting kinds of blocks from kind of these, these sorts of blocks that you, that, are, that you can see through, that have different shapes, different colours. 
to the sorts of blocks that you can use for creating stories in a wide variety of ways. I also really like this idea of a space near to your blocks and small world area that would be a space for a kind of like a, a little enhancement so that the blocks and small world area carries on as it, as it is but this group of children who are fascinated by one particular idea or one particular story, they could bring that to here. Okay, so a little enhancement space. It's then, of course, important to think about actually who do we have within it in terms of the characters, in terms of the people. Well, for early years classrooms, we would always be thinking about the, that, the real life, first of all. So within nursery and reception, think first of all about what real life opportunities are there. So from people to families, family groupings, from that to pets and uh, farmyard animals, all of those sorts of real life things. And then of course from that, as you move through into reception, later on in reception, we might look at some fantasy based characters and people but we also would continue that story-based and fantasy-based character through into year one as well. Um, Sam, a little bit later on, is going to be talking about that progression of characters, progression of small world figures, and that progression of block play also from nursery through into reception and from that into year one. Okay. So that progression. There are also a wide range of textures to be explored and experiences to be explored from blocks like this to exploring, <coughs> uh, explore, exploring different contexts. So this little girl here was uh, amazed by horses, loved horses. On a, on a walk to school on a morning past a field of horses, would always turn up to nursery talking all about the horses that she'd seen. So they used a little enhancement space within the room so that what they could do there is they could encourage this little girl to tell the story of what she'd seen and what the horses had been doing. From that, that to open-ended opportunities of having figures and characters that aren't anybody in particular until that child decides who they're going to be. Okay? Now, sometimes we don't value this enough, I think. Sometimes we see this as not challenging enough that it be, they kind of end up being kind of resigned to the, the kind of heuristic play basket for much younger children. And of course they're useful for that, but they're also extremely challenging too. If you have materials like this within your setting, then you're actually saying to the children, this isn't anybody yet, you decide who it's going to be. And we can talk about, actually, can we, can we use some tissue paper to make a cape if it's going to be a superhero? We can, we can develop that character then. Okay, so sometimes the simplest resources can be the best ones. And don't forget also props and scenery and natural materials. It's often something that people will forget. So things like pieces of material are brilliant, creating a seascape or creating, creating all sorts of different, different textures or different opportunities. Natural materials, even things like sticks or, or gathered materials, particularly at this time of year, are perfect for creating story settings. So if you do go on a walk with your children, gather things up. Can you bring things back to create story settings back at your own setting? Okay, so a wide range of different things. Again, a simple resource are these sorts of fences. Children will often want to, en to enclose what they're playing, you know, when they're playing. So they'll want to create some kind of enclosure and pieces of <coughs> fencing like this are fantastic for that. Okay, um, I added this photograph in. This is from um, uh, a setting in Leeds. This was from Oakwood Academy um, in Leeds. Uh, Co-op Academy, sorry, um, which is at Oakwood in Leeds. And the detail there, you know, that, that idea of thinking about actually what can the children create here? You can see there the, the huge amount of detail I think is fantastic. You know, from adding in things like these small beads and jewels to adding in different shapes, reclaimed materials from different sorts of blocks to add shadows, all sorts of opportunities. I also really like here the use of light so that when she is creating a structure here, you've got a shadow that's being cast on the surfaces behind her. Again, adding to that imaginative opportunity, those imaginative opportunities around storytelling. 
Okay, so have a couple of minutes, have a think about this. How do you currently use small world? Do you have small world play alongside block play within your setting? If not, is it possible to do that? What materials and resources do you have for small world play? Are the resources available continuously? So can they keep going back to those materials and resources? And what do you think at the moment works well and what perhaps needs developing further? Have a couple of minutes and then we will carry on from there. Stop you there, please, if that's all right. We better keep moving with this if that's okay. Right, so lots to think about. Of course, all of that thinking in terms of what you're going to offer, in terms of you know, material, or in terms of natural materials, or in terms of the, the small world characters that you have, or the different blocks, and how you're going to organize it, all of that kind of thing. All of that thinking <coughs> is, of course, planning. Okay, and I think sometimes we don't call it that. I think we should. You know, we, we talk about planning. When I'm often on training, I ask people to tell me what it is that they do in terms of planning. Okay, and people, interestingly, will often assume that what I'm talking about is this week's planning. Okay, that they will say, oh yeah, well this week I'm doing this, this, and this. 
Okay, and of course that is planning. But I would say we often don't think about what is always there and in terms of that level of planning for what's always there. I think we should. I often find that we plan far more for something that is going to be a half an hour or a maybe available just for this week when actually something that's going to be available for 300 days of the year we haven't thought enough about, we haven't planned for it. And I think we should. That level of planning is important. So when we think about... Oh, I was going to say the clicker was working and now it's not. There it is. When we think about planning for an area like this, the small world and blocks area, it's important to think about that level of detail. So in terms of what materials and resources are you providing and what, sort, what is the potential of that resource? What are we aiming for with it? So if we want children to create, for example, really complex structures where they're going to have different floors within a structure that they've built, then what will they need? They will need some flat boards as well as the wooden blocks that they have in order to be able to place them there and then build again and then place another one on there. So it's important to think through, well, actually, what is it that we want our children to be able to do and want them to be able to learn through doing or engaging within this space? And if we want them to be able to do that, then what materials, what resources will we need to offer them? And sometimes the simplest resources can make all the difference. So, you know, flat pieces of board within that area can make all the difference. Okay. Um, in terms of... Um, planning, we would recommend that each area, including the small world and blocks area, really needs to have a plan for it. And that plan would include what is it that we're aiming for? What are those intended experiences? What materials and resources are we going to offer? Alongside that, how will it be organised? So, for example, the shadow backing, you know, that idea of where is it going to be on the shelf? How is it going to be organised? That needs to be really thought through. And then, crucially, of course, where does that link? Where does all of that learning link to the different areas of learning? Where does it link to mathematics? Where does it link to literacy? Where does it link to communication and language? And, of course, crucially, What's the role of the adult within this space? Will the adults in your setting know how to support children in this area? Will we be consistent in terms of language and vocabulary when we're engaging with children within this space? Will we be asking the right questions? Will we be asking open-ended questions? Will we be supporting them effectively? Okay, so such a lot that goes into this. Um, if you want to know more about this, there's more information about planning in this way on the Early Excellence website. So if you go to the Ideas and Inspiration section of the Early Excellence website, there's, there are some example plans a bit like this one for you to be able to go on, go and have a look at. We've also got our um, continuous provision planning guide which is available it is in the cafe and in the resource center if you want to go and have a look at a copy of that following on from the session we've got um, plans for all of the different provision areas including small world and blocks within that publication okay right so having talked about all of that detail there what you of course need without a doubt is that real life example of what does that look like then in practice? And of course, lucky for us, we have got Sam, Sam Smith here um, from Flanshaw Junior and Infant School in Wakefield. And Sam is going to take you through what they have done within their setting. Okay, at the, at the Junior Infant School at Flanshaw, they've developed small world and block play right the way through from nursery into reception and then beyond into key stage one and so sam's going to tell you all about that over to you sam <laughs> yeah hopefully if it doesn't i'll stand over there and i can move it on for you all right hi everybody uh, i'll try and keep it uh, quick because i know you all uh, want to get home you've all had busy long days but um thank you for listening so basically at flanshaw we started on a big journey i've been there six years now um, and what we did with our provision is we looked at all our areas of provision, we did an audit right from nursery right into year one. So looking at um, what provision we offered, what, how we could develop that provision and also how we could offer that level of challenge. Because we're lucky enough in our school that we can offer provision, as I say, nursery reception and year one. Our school, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, we're in quite a deprived area. We've got quite a lot of children uh, with really poor speech and language. 
We only have, I would say last year, I think we had 5% at baseline at expected level. So you get a picture of kind of our starting point really. So for us, small world and block area was a real focus to really develop <coughs> that language, to develop that communication, and also to develop staff's confidence and staff knowledge as well, because obviously that's so important for everybody. Um, so we got the whole team together and we worked on it as a team so that everybody was involved, everybody was part of it and they came on the journey with us, which was really important. Uh, I did a lot of work with Andy, I was very lucky at my last school uh, before Flanshaw to do a lot of work with Andy, so I brought quite a lot of that knowledge from Early Excellence um, for us as, as well for our journey. So this is a photograph of our nursery provision um, and as Andy said obviously we've put small world and block area together and things that we kind of have the same, we looked at what resources we could offer that were the same, what resources we could offer that were different in nursery reception in year one. So for us, we've kept the blocks as the same. Obviously, they're quite open-ended resources. So we've got blocks in nursery reception, which I'll show you in a second, and then year one as well. But we've kind of extended that with other things as well. So for example, we've got all the materials there. We might offer different sort of textured materials, different colors. Uh, things for them to create story settings with. Um, again, thinking about children's speech and language, we wanted to give them those real life people. So people who help us in nursery, um, people and families as well, so that children feel familiar, they've got something that they can actually use and think, I can talk about that person in my family, it creates that discussion um, with them as well. So we offer that in nursery and also the characters, um, as Andy said, the open-ended wooden people. We actually have, every child has a photograph taken when they start in our setting and we put a bit of sticky velcro on those people and they all create their own little mini-me characters. So they choose those characters, obviously themselves, or if it wants to be somebody different they can. We have the teachers in there as well, so they can actually act out using their mini-me's or the teachers or... For example, when they come into reception, we might have the nursery teachers as well, so it's that familiar person that they can use in their role play and their storytelling as well. And we found that's quite an effective resource to have, and they quite like seeing themselves on the little people as well, which is quite nice. So this is our nursery, uh, small world and block area. It's working. <laughs> this is our reception. Um, again, we've added things like graph paper so that children can design their own structures. Um, obviously we teach them how to do that, we don't just expect children to pick a clipboard up and just miraculously design it for themselves. We do teach them, we spend a lot of time sort of modelling that. So one of the first stories we look at in reception um, is Rosie's Walk, because it's quite a, a simple repetitive story, it's got lots of mathematical language in there, it's got lots of opportunities that we actually sit with the children in the small world and block area and we <coughs> teach them as a literacy session Rose's walk and we map it out on the large rolls of paper, we use the resources that are in that area so that they're actually shown how to use it and then we've found that children go back and do it themselves which is really nice and then we introduce the mini-me's to them and say if you were um, going on Rose's walk where would you go, you go over the haystack, those types of things as well so that they're going on that experience and that journey themselves as well, which is really nice for them. And you'll find that they actually take the mini-me's and they'll say, shall we go on Rosie's Walk today or shall we do this? And it's really nice to see that develop and that progression over time as well. So a little bit more fantasy for us in the uh, in reception. So again, we've got the people, we've got, um, we add in um, different, uh, different types of people as well. Um, the f more fantasy so they can create their own stories. We add in uh, different 3D blocks so we add in a little bit more challenge for them. And then we add in um, elements of measure as well so that they've got uh, little spirit levels that they can make sure that their uh, buildings are um, <coughs> accurate and level, they can measure them, they can cre um, create different levels. And then we have the children hold up the different 3D shapes and just take photographs so that they know the, the um, names of the shapes as well. And they quite like looking at their pictures as well on there. And all our children do all of the uh, display labels, so we get the children to write themselves so they're part of the labelling. So all the photographs of them are obviously not there beforehand, and we get them involved in setting up the area as well and adding those labels to, it, to the areas. And then progressing on to year one, 
So we just look at the way that that's uh, displayed a little bit differently. So we've added more mathematical language. You can't really see here, sorry. But um, in terms of we've added numbers, so how many of each thing are in each area. You can add in addition, so two of this item plus two of this item, obviously getting that mathematical language in there as well, and that level of challenge as you go into key stage one. Uh, different types of blocks are more storytelling, sort of wooden blocks in there, the mirrors we add. So just thinking about how that can progress from nursery, being a little bit more um, basic to obviously the level of challenge in year one. And then again, you can just see a bit more clearly now uh, on the 3D shapes. So we're saying that we've got 10 cylinders in there, 12 cones. And you'll find that in key stage one, we were quite surprised with how protective they get. So we have little tidy up monitors so that they're in charge of that area. So they make sure they're counting the 10 cylinders, they're counting the 12 cones. So they do get quite protective. Oh, we're missing uh, one cone. So they, they go on a hunt then and try and find it. Um, so it gives them ownership as well of their classroom and they're very aware of what belongs where. So we found it's been really effective and we found that it's developed a lot more mathematical language, a lot more mathematical thinking in there alongside obviously their communication as well. So this is a, an example of a child that's just started with us in nursery, obviously never been in our setting at all before. And just having those open-ended resources and just allowing him to explore the different textures, the different levels, the different things that uh, we offer, he's just created his own structure and then an adult sat with him then and developed adding the characters, adding the people, where could they go, what could be happening um, and giving that level of, of um, challenge for him as well. So moving on, I teach in reception, so there's a lot more things about reception, obviously, because um, that's my first-hand experience of things I've done. So we did um, a photo opportunity with Early Excellence. They came in with the cameras and just actually observed what our children were doing, how they were using the areas. You can see there that the boys are using the books, so they're actually thinking about what they want to create from the books we're providing them. Um, and thinking about their interests as well. So this little boy had just been in the six week holidays, he'd been to uh, Royal Armouries Museum. So he was fascinated by it. So we, we tried to link the books and the experience that he'd had into the small world and block area. And he was just so fascinated. He went back for weeks and weeks and created different things, which I'll show you later on um, in that area. And just to see how that progressed was amazing. And as Andy said, we'd left a little bit at the side so that he could keep that model, so he could actually go back to it and develop that uh, model later on, uh, which is really purposeful as well, obviously, for the children, giving them that time to adapt and develop their ideas. Uh, so giving them, obviously, implements that they can draw. So we've got the graph paper, we've got the rulers, the clipboards, and having them just think about how their model is going to look before they actually so it's that planning process as well before they actually build a model instead of just thinking right i'm going to put these blocks on top of each other which a lot of our children did initially it, it's talking to them about what do you think you'd like to create showing them those books showing them photographs showing them different things that they might want to create talking about their own experiences where have they been what would they like to make and getting them involved um, as a group so this is Zach, who I say has just been to um, Royal Army Museum. He wanted to recreate things that he'd seen. He wanted to recreate his own experiences. So he's using the colour blocks alongside um, the wooden blocks to create different structures. He could talk about it. He was quite happy to talk to his friends about what he was doing and actually test out. Um, he didn't know what the spirit level was or what his job was or what he did. He'd never seen one before, so it was all that sort of introduction of that new language and, and where that went with him as well which was really exciting for him and the different shapes of the the blocks as well so and he's taken his own mini me as you probably can't see it attached to it at the back um going on that adventure with him as well so the little mini me characters are on the blocks there and you can see how the boys have sort of developed their drawings um, through that as well and then that was their story that they created at the end. I don't know if you can see it properly. Once upon a time there lived a princess and a prince. And there was a castle and the prince saw a kind castle and went there to rescue the princess at the end. So he's created that story himself. It's quite a simple story but he was so proud of it. He wanted to 
read it to the class when he'd finished, he wanted to show the class the structure he'd made, the setting, um, and he knew that he'd created that story himself. So it, it gives that sort of sense of achievement and pride in, in their work as well. And Zach was somebody who was quite uh, reluctant to write initially, um, was quite nervous because he didn't want to get it wrong. So just having those open-ended resources and having that time to develop it, there was no rush. You know, he wasn't sat there with a book and guided writing saying, right, come on, we need to get to the next one. It was kind of given that time and able to develop that story himself, uh, which was really nice for him. Uh, this is a photograph I took uh, just before the holidays. So um, a little girl, Nancy, who's just started in our setting, obviously it started in September, new to reception. Um, again, was quite a shy little girl, needed that kind of adult um, facilitating that learning for her. She loved to go in the small world block area and just create simple structures but actually spending an afternoon in there with her, showing her the resources that we had. So uh, she was just building a simple structure and I talked to her about, let's look at these books, you know, is there anything that you'd like in these books? Would you like to create it? And sort of supporting her then to put her ideas onto paper, drawing out. She spent absolutely ages drawing the plans out, what she wanted, adding the detail, something that I didn't know she was able to do until I actually obviously went in there and worked with her. Um, then from drawing out her structure. I don't want to do it here and then then you've jumped me twice. Yeah. So there we are. Thank you. You can just see the level of detail uh, that she's put in her drawing there. So obviously this is recent, um, she's just done this. The level of detail she's got there, the different um, 3D blocks she's used, the wooden blocks, and I said, oh now we've created a structure, shall we add some characters? Um, to your structure, should we think about, should we tell a story and she absolutely loved then thinking about what character she could add to her small uh, small structure, thinking about what um, her characters could be doing, she went and found a mini-me, then she took a mini-me uh, in there as well and it, it sparked quite a lot of discussion <coughs> um, around what she created, where she wanted to take it, again developing that language and she's just labelled here. Uh, only initial sounds, obviously, um, she's at the start of the year, so just initial sounds. I helped her to spell Sound Out Castle, um, but just those little labels there, and she's uh, then feeling really proud of herself that she's labelled her work, um, and she's been able to add some writing to that as well. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> and this is the story uh, that she created from it. Now, it's a story that I scribed for her because I didn't want her to be put off by saying, right, you've got to now write a story because she would have just got up and left and not wanted to participate. So we kind of thought about a story together and I said, oh, shall I write it down so that we're becoming authors together of your story? And then after I'd read back what we'd discussed and what we'd said together, she then said, I've just written a story. So she knew that she'd been part of this story and she felt I could just see the pride in her face. And she went and told a friend and she asked me to read the story again to a friend. And then she retold the story in her own words, uh, what she created and used the little characters in her uh, structure to retell that story, which for me was a real achievement for her being quite a shy uh, little girl. And I didn't know she had those um, abilities until I actually spent that time um, and worked in there with her. So once upon a time there lived a little fairy in the castle. The fairy was scared of the witch the witch wanted to put her into jail with a spell to turn her into mice. Oh no, she said, and I thought I'm adding those words as well so that she, she's obviously feeling like she's told the story. Um, the witch was in uh, the top of the tallest tower. She looked out of the window to see if she could find the fairy. The witch was very <coughs> angry. She saw the fairy escape from the castle. The fairy flew away from the witch and then she ended her story with ever after. So I just added those little describing words of the tallest tower and then just said to her, and the fairy lived happily ever after, adding that star language in there for her. But that gave her such pride and purpose that with that simple structure, she'd been able to then recreate her own story um, <coughs> herself. And just little things like that, spending that little time with them, you can really develop that language and that confidence to be able to do that themselves and independently. So for us, it's been quite a powerful journey uh, to go on and sort of develop children's confidence uh, throughout nursery right into key stage one.
That's it. I've tried to keep you just before Very I good. sit down. Very well. <laughs> Round of applause for Sam. Thank you. Thank you. We came to Flamsdor Junior Infants and did some, uh, we, we took photographs and we also did a bit of filming as well. And we took one short film of um, children in Key Stage 1 playing with the small world and blocks, within the small world and blocks area. Um, so this is a short film of the different things that those children do within that area. It's only quite short, um, but it's kind of speeded up so that you can see the progression of ideas. So what you think of this, and it's quite interesting, this is the last thing we're going to do, but quite an interesting thing just to see, actually, where do those children get to, and what does that look like in terms of key stage one practice? So... Okay, which just about brings us to the end of the session. I hope you found this session useful. I hope it's given you lots to think about. Thank you very much for joining in with all of the conversations and the discussions. Um, it really does help, I think. And thank you also to the new people who have joined us online as well, on Facebook, of course. I keep forgetting about those people. Thank you very much to all of you people watching from wherever you happen to be as well. Um, if you're onto social, into social media and all of that sort of thing, um, we have been sharing as we've been going through the session, we've been sharing all sorts of things online. So if you're on Twitter or on Facebook or on, on Instagram or all of those different kinds of platforms, um, do feel free to go on there and give us a like or give us a share and kind of spread the word because we do. Well, I'd like to think we do some pretty good work here that I think is important. Some key messages that I think really are important to share and to get out there. So if you're out there on Facebook, then please do give us a like and a share and so on. Um, in terms of other things that, you, that you'll definitely need to know about, well, there's one, I think, really great thing, actually. Um, I don't know whether you noticed this. Those people who are here in the room with us, in the cafe, there are some free resources for you to take away. These are story bags, uh, number bags, and poetry and rhyme bags. They're free if you want to go and grab yourself... A pack, you can do that. I think there's a pack of five in each one. So, yeah, they're free. Go and help yourselves. Also, in terms of free things, um, we have our Early Excellence podcast, which um, is available um, on... Well, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and all of the different platforms as well. Um, we do all kinds of different things. So I present the podcast. I interview lots of different people. In fact, I'll be interviewing uh, Emma very shortly for the podcast over the next few weeks or so. Um, well worth listening in if you haven't already. Also, there are loads of free things that are on the Early Excellence website from blogs to the podcast to the planning guides and training videos. There's loads of free things. Just go to the Ideas and Inspiration section on the Early Excellence website. There's a drop-down box. There are loads of free things on there. And if you want to get in touch, so if you're interested in us coming to you to deliver training or come to you for consultancy or just some support or a question or a query, then do get in touch. My email address is there, andy at earlyexcellence.com. 
That's me on Twitter, um, at AndyBurtEEX. Um, if you put into place any of the things, whether it be fantastic artwork that Emma was sharing earlier on and those, those creative approaches, if it was that, or whether it's uh, the small world and block play that we've shared with you in this second session, if you put some of those things into place and you think, oh, do you know what, I really want an audience for this, get in touch with me on Twitter and I will share it out there and we'll get lots of people seeing your fantastic work. All right. Thank you ever so much for coming along today. I know it's a big thing coming out at the end of a school day, as I said earlier on. Thank you ever so much for coming along. <laughs> Lovely to see you. The centre is still open if you want to have a wander around. The resource centre is still open. But, uh, yeah.